Hey everybody, this is Peter from The Halo Effect. You're watching Richard Metal Fan. Hey everyone, episode 167 of Richard Metal Fan Interviews. And today's guest, we're talking to Peter Iwers. He is the bassist for the band The Halo Effect, best known him as the former bassist of In Flames. Today we're going to be talking to him about what got him into metal, what made him want to slap out the bass, and also do a rundown of his discography. And so without further ado, let's go talk to Peter. So what's up, guys? I have the honor and the privilege to speak with the great Peter Iwers from The Halo Effect. How are you doing today, man? Hello. I'm great, man. I'm just, I just woke up, so I'm still having my morning coffee sitting here on my patio, just trying to enjoy the weather, but it's, the weather is a little bit sketchy here in Sweden right now. Yeah, I woke up. How like, are you? Doing good. I woke up like 15 minutes ago. It is like four in the morning here in my time. Thing, but well, it's all worth it. you deserve to be tired. I, I really don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So kind of like the format is I want to do like a rundown of your discography and talk about like your musical journey as an artist. So take me back to young Peter Iwers. So kind oh. of growing up in Sweden, what were the first bands that got you into metal and what made you want to slap at the bass? Well, <clears throat> my first first ever concert was I was 12 years old and I went by myself to see a non-metal artist called Whitney Houston uh, in Gothenburg and that was amazing I remember just being inspired by her musical catalog and her persona on stage and the way she interacted with the audience uh, she had a stage in the middle of the of the whole audience and uh, this is back in 87 uh, that, that made a big impact on me uh, as far as music goes um, the year after, I went to Iron Maiden in Halloween. It was my first metal show ever. Wow. And that was the key moment where I knew I wanted to be a musician. I was 13, and I made my way all up to the front. I remember Kai Hansen and Halloween giving me a thumbs up, and uh, I remember, you know, interacting, you know, locking eyes and stuff with Iron Maiden and seeing their, even, you know, as they always had this fantastic stage show and fantastic uh, stage presence, and I just knew that this is what I want to do. And then it just kept on going. I started, I kept on playing instruments. I always have been playing instruments and I started playing more and more guitar. And uh, as the years developed, I started forming bands. And uh, we did some, we, we really didn't know what we wanted to sound like, depending on which band I was in. But when I was about 16, I met a, a friend of mine and uh, we found a new friend. We found mutual interest in uh, Ingrid Malmsteen and stuff like that. So we started the band and got some other people in and we just knew that we wanted to be a metal band. We just kept on going from there, you know, rehearsing, playing shows, making demos, breaking up, starting a new band, continuing. And it wasn't until I was uh, nine, no, how was it? Oh, it was 20, 19 or 20, something like that, uh, where I was asked to join the, my buddies in In Flames because their bass player had the uh, he didn't want to tour anymore. Maybe I was a little older. I I, I forget. But anyways, uh, yeah, I was older. I was 20-something. But that's when I started uh, really getting into the heavy side of the music. Because before that, it had been more like pop, prog, uh, art rock, all that stuff. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to... Um, John Mijong from Dream Theater. You know, all those people. I just wanted to make my own mix of of the uh, uh, melodies and trying to be somebody play like uh, way where I could support the drums and be the rhythm section while I still painted a nice picture with some melodies, you know, like they do. And uh, so that's that's where it all started. You know, short short uh, version of about ten years. Awesome. And I think I noticed like on your page on Metal Archives, I believe your first band before I think it was in flames was Chameleon. Was that like before in flames? Chameleon was before in flames and uh, that was just a duo. That was the, the guitar player I was telling you about. We definitely wanted to sound like Dream Theater. We were so inspired by Dream Theater. We did a lot of Dream Theater inspired songs, um, but we could never find the right lineup. And uh the hardest part was to, was to find a drummer. And uh, when we actually found one, we were trying to find a singer. And we actually auditioned uh, Joe. I came from Hammerfall a couple of times. And he was great, but he was busy with his stuff. Um, so uh, 
when I was asked to join In Flames, we just put Chameleon on hold. And uh, we actually tried to revive it a couple of times, but it didn't happen for various reasons. All right. And how did you get to like know the guys? How did you get to know like Anders and Bjorn and everybody and then Flames? Well, uh, we come from a, we come from a really small city in Gothenburg, and the area where we all grew up in uh, the, on the west side is um, Bjorn came from something called Frölunda, where Niklas also comes from, and Jesper, Anders, and I uh, come from Bilda, which is uh, it's really not that far from each other. And growing up, we all had this um, youth centers where everybody could play. It's like places where people went just to hang out and shoot some pools and, and uh, where we all could uh, borrow rehearsal space and borrow equipment and stuff like that. So people just went from one uh, youth center to another and played shows. And that's kind of how we got connected. And when you're from Gothenburg, nobody really, there's no like competition. There's more like people helping each other out. So as soon as somebody had a show, they asked for somebody else, like like, like a proper show, not just youth centers, but let's say they had a show. They had, we had this legendary venue called Valvet in Gothenburg. Um, and if somebody had a show there, they always looked for openers. And then they asked their friends, so those people they saw at that show. So, you know, <clears throat> it's very small. You There's not, not a lot to do. Either you played a lot of sports or you played music, basically. And most of us did both, and then you had to choose one path instead of the other. So some people actually went on to play hockey and, and football and stuff like that, soccer. And uh, some people, most people, most of my friends went on to play music. So it was just natural. Everybody growing up together, together or, or knowing somebody that knew somebody. And then eventually we were just a big gang. It was like uh, the guys from Dark Tranquility, some of the guys from The Flames, my my bands and my friends. And some other people around from the city just always hung out. So when it was time for their bass player to leave, I was the natural choice, I guess. Uh, cool. So you're all like homies in the scene. So pretty much everybody like knows each other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so tell me about making your first album, Colony. I actually loved this album. So what was the thought process making this album being a, so it was like your first record with the band? <clears throat> I was uh, super excited because I actually, I joined in flames just before they released Oracle. So the Hor Oracle was uh, recorded and done with the Johan, uh, the previous bass player. And um, my first tour was supporting that album. So I was so psyched to be out. And, you know, but when, when it was time to make another record, I was like, oh, yes. Now it's finally time for me to make my debut on a, on a full-length record. And uh, I was in, in heaven, you know, playing with these amazing musicians and songwriters and getting to play the songs and putting my touch on it the way that I wanted it. Like I said before, with you know, I wanted to be a rhythm based player, but I always wanted to play a little bit, a little bit more, not in a way to show off, but just in a way to kind of uh, spice up the song, according to me, to color the music with, with some bass lines while keeping it steady. And uh, so I was just, I was just very, very happy. Yeah. Yeah, especially like my, my the song "Embody the Invisible," a great opener. And, and fun fact, in fact, apparently it was on the soundtrack to uh, Tony Hawk's Underground. So, how cool was it to have like one of your songs in a video game? It's correct. That was fantastic. I remember uh, we played that game a lot uh, alongside a bunch of other games. But I remember especially the first time I came to uh, to San Francisco. I think it was the Underground, but it was one of the Tony Hawk's in a ways that that. Uh, had a, a couple of scenes in San Francisco. And uh, I remember going down to uh, where's it, Pier 39 and the, the dock and just trying to find all the stuff that, that you know, that you've seen on TV. This is my first time ever in San Francisco. And I just realized, hey, I played to them. So according to the, the sea lines should be up here to the right. And they were, you know, <laughs> it was pretty cool. And I, I learned all the bait from, from the video game. But I mean, it was it was fantastic. Just hearing our song uh, on a video game was um, amazing. Such a big video game, also with say, renowned, um, very. Um, <clears throat> it felt like a, a giant step in our career. Yeah, and I noticed you also like did a remake of an old so song behind space. Space. What made you to, to, uh, guys to, like redo like a song that you've already done like years ago? Well, the band space was with uh, the former members of In Flames, and I think I don't really remember what uh, who came up with the idea. Uh, 
but I remember thinking it was great to do a new version of it because then we could put our sound on it. Uh, it was, as far as I remember, it was only Jesper who was on that album. I think that the other two. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, so we did it uh, a new take, and it just felt like refreshing, dusting off a fantastic song, and just making it a new version. Awesome. So, and then, then do you remember like the first, like some of the first tours you did in support of Colony? <clears throat> well, like I said, I started my first touring started with uh, supporting uh, Oracle, and the first tour we did there was with the Dimmy Borger. I remember in Europe supporting them. That was fantastic. Great guys, still friends with them to this day. You know that were amazing. Uh, <clears throat> The first tour with supporting Colony, I think. I think the I don't remember exactly which one was the first, but I know that this was the first album to take us to the US. Yeah. We went wow. to we played with Walking Metal Fest, and then we did a two three week uh, together with uh, Moonspell and Jack Pants. No, Jack Pants was later. Yeah, Moonspell. Uh, we did that. It's there's been so many tours, so it's a blur which one we did with uh, supporting that album. But I know we did a European tour. I think we did with um, was it Nightingales and Dimmy Borger as well. I think, and I think that was supporting Colony. Yeah, yeah. And how? And you mentioned that was like the first time you you was that like the first time you ever was in the U.S. So how was that experience like being in America for the first time? <clears throat> it was great. We came over in ninety nine. Uh, yeah, we came over in ninety nine to do uh, Milwaukee Metal Fest just that festival uh, and we spent a week there just hanging around drinking beer you know meeting buddies getting to know new people and it was surreal because back then you know uh, it was definitely worlds uh, you know an ocean between us so to speak it was definitely <clears throat> it wasn't there was no in internet or anything like that it was just um, well there was I guess but there wasn't as big as it's today so coming over to a whole different continent and a whole different country and seeing a different culture Seeing all this stuff, you know, the bars that you've seen on TV and the, you know, the club scene and, and just getting to know and meeting a lot of people in different bands. I remember it was fantastic. It was, I was overwhelmed with all this. So quite shortly after this, we came back with the most stuff to do this. Okay. Which was also amazing. Great learning period. You know, we were young and, you know, I wouldn't say spoiled. We were young and, um, you know, just enjoying day by day. Just having fun, not really thinking of consequences, just having fun, laughing, playing shows, meeting people, enjoying ourselves the way it should be. This was before, you know, we grow grow up and got kids and families where we could just go out on, on the road and have fun. Awesome. And then your next album, Clayman. I I love this album. So what was that like going from Colony to Clayman? Thank you. <clears throat> It was pretty natural, as far as I remember. We, there were some songs that were written. We hung out in the studio all the time, or at least some other guys did. I was busy because I just was. I was a new parent at the time. Um, but I remember recording in uh, the new studio, Fredman Complex, and uh, just you know being there was legendary because he had recorded. I mean, he he became a friend, but he had also recorded a lot of these classical albums, you know, with uh, of course in Flames and the Doctrine Quality and at Gates and all that. So, uh, so recording that place was uh, super cool. Just uh, being in the in the same feel uh, as uh, as him, and uh, again with us, just enjoying ourselves, playing music, trying to you know, create something that we ourselves love. Because we were never about recording music or writing music for somebody else. It was always for ourselves. So uh, when uh, when we did play, man, it just felt fantastic, and uh, I don't know what it felt. In retrospect, I can't speak for the others, of course, but in retrospect, I think we all felt that there was something cooking with this music. It felt good. It felt like we had we had an album behind us where we had um, this lineup. We had uh, some touring behind us. We had grown stronger as a unit, and to record an album like that was it felt fantastic. Yeah, I especially love like the going into like Bullet Ride. I think that's like a hell of an opener. And I like a pinball map is another one mm -hmm. of my favorite in flame songs. So tell me about like make that <clears> song because that's like pretty much one of my favorite in flame songs. Pinball map. 
or both of them? Yeah, or both. Well, uh, basically, back then there was uh, basically back then it was always a lot of the songs were made during rehearsals. They were made by Jesper or Bjorn, showing some riffs or some full ideas, and then we put our touch on them, kind of, you know. Um, I think Pinball Map was written in the studio one night when the other guys hung out, and some of them made up a riff and did some tricky beer and you know making a song. Uh, I remember coming in the next day, listening to it, and thinking that was this is amazing, fantastic song written, and uh, and uh, then I guess you know the vocals were done on it, were written on it, and we just added it bit by bit. I guess there was always a plan from the main songwriters how it was going to come out. But I think that the way that it, uh, it was recorded uh, also put some uh, aspect on it. Um, you know, when the drums comes in, Daniel has a very unique way of playing drumming. He's a fantastic drummer. And that definitely set the tone to the to the song, I would say. Um, but all this, you know, the, like you said, the fantastic riff, uh, theme riff and all that. And then the, 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 the chorus, I think. I'd like to think that it was... Obviously, because we played a lot of pinball in the studio, you know that we kind of saw the vision. But I'm not going to go and speak for his lyrics because I don't, I don't want to talk about uh, somebody else's uh, work. Uh, but for me, it was like we were. It's, I gotta take a minute and let it sink in because it's, it's not something I think about every day. I just remember all those days being a lot of fun. Here's a new song. You you know, uh, go in and do your thing on it. And uh, I did. We did. You know, it was came out really great. I'm really grateful, you know, to have been part of In Flames for all these years and doing this together with other guys. We had so much fun. Yeah, and I don't know if you're familiar with like the the lyric interpretation videos, but like one of my favorite songs of like I mentioned, Pitball Map. There's that line that says, "Who was sent to, to glorify?" And somebody did like a I guess a lyric inter funny lyric interpretation. It said Homer Simpson couldn't fly. I don't know if you're like aware of that because that's something that became a little bit of like a meme a bit. A bit. <laughs> no. Oh no, I no, I haven't seen that. Sorry. Yeah, I, I'm gonna look it up after this. Though. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's a hilarious a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then next up is uh, Reroute to Remain. Just going to get some more coffee. It's a, all right. Next up, Reroute to Remain. I like mm -hmm. this album, but it's a little bit of a different, like a different evolution for In Flames. So what, what was the thought process going into making this album? And hard to believe last year was, of course, 20 years of this album. Sorry, what was the? Yeah, I was talking about the next album, Reroute to Remain. I, what were you saying? What was say? Say because you know last year was the twenty. Yeah, year I just did, I didn't hear. Yeah. Yeah. So how? Do, so what was like the the thought process? Because I know it was like a musical evolution from uh, Clayman to this. Well. <laughs> Going back to all these albums, I think there was never a, like a decision to change the sound or anything like that. Uh, there was just a um, us evolving by listening to new music, uh, growing up, uh, experiences, other stuff in life, and all that. You know, it's as as you you grow as a human being, you grow as a musician and as a songwriter. And I, I'd say that there was never any because we got a lot of feedback, positive and negative, from that album. Um, a lot of people saying negative stuff that we were influenced by this and that. It's like, yeah, we were influenced by everything. We were always influenced by Iron Maiden and Slayer and, you know, the Bay Area Crash and Morbid Angel and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, but we were also influenced by new music and we just made music again like we wanted it to sound like. Um, so we changed studios. We went to dugout studios with Daniel Bergstrand. And we lived in a house for about six, seven weeks. Went to the studio every day and uh, recorded our stuff there. And uh, never really thought about if it was a different sound or anything. I know Anders wanted to sing a little bit more. And he, you know, learned a lot by doing that. We all grew as musicians and... Um, developed, I'd say, very naturally. Um, and what came out of it was, I guess, one of the most successful albums we ever did. 
uh, that was definitely the album that took us on a different journey that took us to bigger tours. Like we went on tour with Slayer, we went on tour with Ice Earth, which also had the Jag Cancer band, uh, as I previously mentioned. And it took us out just doing what we love doing, playing music without us changing our idea of how to write music, without us doing something, um, what do you say, something, uh, um, without us compromising our way of writing music. We just kept on writing what we felt like, you know, and that's what came out. But I'm re- I really liked that album. It yeah. was, uh, had a great time doing it, and I, I really like it. Yeah, like Cloud Connected, Trigger, even the title track. Still some of my favorite songs on this album. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, This also to... took us out in, in uh, Sweden a lot. You know, this is where Sweden started to uh, find an interest in the heavier music uh, big time. You know, we, we got some, some songs on the charts. We got some songs on the video charts. And we were invited to play the, like the some pop galas and stuff like that, along with the, the pop artists and stuff like that. And this hadn't really happened before because people seem to be so scared of, of uh, you know, death metal. Um, and so we uh, we actually went out and, and did a lot of these shows. And again, just by doing what we love, just by writing music and uh, having a good time, I think it, yeah, it couldn't be better. Yeah, and especially like uh, the music video for the song Trigger, which had like soil work. Like apparently they were like being like antagonists or something. Yeah. But then, then their their video for Rejection Roll, like yeah, like they you kind of like switched the role. So how would the idea of that their that video and their video come to be? I think it was the director uh, Roger who came up with that idea. Uh, I might be mistaken here. So apologies, apologies. Um, but we we were good friends with Soilwork. We always were. We toured a lot. But there was always this talk in in you know on on the forums and stuff like that of us trying to steal from each other, of us you know being uh, not friends and all this bullshit because we were great friends. So we just decided to do something about it and try. And you know we make a video where we actually look like we we're rivals, but we do the two videos at the same time and we star in each other's videos. So that was a great time. Um, uh, and I guess it didn't play out as much as we thought it would be. Uh, like, uh, I'm going to let my cat out. With um, with um, uh, people really thinking that it was a, a rivalry. But uh, it, we had good times. Two great songs that came out. Yeah. And then next up is Soundtrack to Your Escape. And hard to believe next year will be the 20-year anniversary of this album. So how... What was that like going going from this to this? <laughs> Getting old. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, we had a lot of touring. Uh, we had a lot of touring done after this. Uh, we had a lot of uh, personal stuff. Uh, I remember I just went through a divorce. Uh, we rented a house in Denmark where we actually built the whole uh, old two studios, one for guitars and bass and one for vocals. And we lived there for six, seven weeks, just, you know, drinking beer making food uh we brought along some friends who, who uh served as you had a guitar technician with us and a chef and they all helped out with a little bunch of stuff and we just tried to you know have, have a good time while writing and recording a, an album and uh, this is what came out i'm i think it was in my personal life it was a dark year in my musical life it was a really light year you know i had a, a great time um Looking back into it, you know, being able to rent the big house for all this time and writing music and recording it and just living the dream, basically. What 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 could be, you know, it couldn't be better. So when this came out, we got some songs um, that we were able to do some really cool video, videos with, Quiet Place, for instance. And uh, I think it took us on, it kept us going uh, on the same uh, journey, uh, touring-wise and musical-wise, us evolving, trying some new stuff. By this time, we discovered a bunch of criticism when it came to some stuff because I guess people were a lot. Some people wanted to us to stay in the hundred percent melodic death metal. Uh, we figured we still did. We changed some uh, some parts of the guitar into like keyboards, and we had some more clean vocals and stuff. But this was our way of evolving naturally and uh, trying to you know make the music interesting and keep the music interesting for ourselves. Yeah, because you don't want to like like stick because there's always like the damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you have like a 
the formula that you kind of like stay with people say that you're repetitive but if you try to like experiment man or something thing people say that you're inconsistent but at the end of the day you gotta like stick to what you believe and just do what you, you want to do i always said that if the moment you start listening to what other people tell you what you should do that's when you you know compromise your your uh your id you know you gotta stay you gotta just listen to yourselves you know we're five individuals and uh, uh jesper and bjorn were the main songwriters um and we kind of added our stuff onto theirs um and i think that's that's all that we should listen to you know it always been because i mean same thing now when we make music with the halo effect it's it's uh it's for us basically it comes down to music that we are going to write and enjoy as individuals you know we're not making music to please somebody else we're making music to fulfill ourselves yeah and then next up is come clarity another great album of, of yours so what was the thought process going into making this album uh i just by this time we were touring so much so making albums was something we did in between tours a little bit uh I'm, I'm i can't speak for everybody but obviously the songs were very very important and to try and make some uh to go into the studio and make songs was something necessary to keep us going on the road which is what we always wanted to do but at the same time you wanted to make the studio experience something uh something unique and uh, something you know memorable and pleasurable so we did that. We went back into Studio Fredman on this one. Uh, but we had different uh, producers. We actually took over the whole complex of Studio Fredman and it became IF Studios. Uh, so this is where we recorded this whole thing. We recorded ourselves, uh, except for Daniel, who did the drums up in Dugout Studios with Daniel Bergstrand still. Uh, and I think Anders did the vocals with Daniel as well. The rest of us recorded ourselves. And then we sent it up to something called Tool Technique up in Umeå for mixing. I remember it was a little different having a band member record me rather than a producer, uh, both good and bad. The good was that you had your best friend sitting there recording you. The bad thing was that you you kind of need somebody who can push you into being a better version of yourself while recording. So I remember really lacking that. And uh, we never did this again. <laughs> Next time we had a producer uh, again. But um, it was a great album. It came, uh, we signed a, deal with ferret records in the u.s and uh, we really tried to focus on the whole world this time and uh doing videos that yet could appeal to a video uh, to, could appeal to anybody and everybody whether you were metal or not without compromising our way of writing we just still wrote the songs or they wrote the songs um in a way in a manner of just keep on evolving without losing yourself kind of yeah yeah, and I heard like the we had, first ballad. We had come come clarity, you know, that became quite huge. Yeah, because I I know heard like the the actual working title for this album was "Crawl Through Knives," but I was just curious how did you end up coming up with uh, "Come Clarity" the album title? I I think it was uh, our our singer who came up with that. He was, uh, I mean, it's his lyrics and his uh, his uh, context, you know, his his uh, the the. The lyrics are his vision, his version of you know. I mean, he's he writes, he wrote all of his stuff um, for his version of it. So I don't know, I don't know exactly how he came about with. That. I don't really remember, but I remember he always explained to us, "This is the title. This means that, and this means this." You know, and I think like that. But I can't really. I don't really remember exactly this. Maybe exactly what it what it sounds like. Come clarity is like an epiphany. Ah, you know, this is this is the way it is. This is the way it sounds, and this is what it should be. That's just you know, just a theory. I don't know. You'd have to ask him. Yeah, yeah. It's still, great title, though. Great lyrics. Yeah, yeah. Like take this life, and even the title track are still some of some staples, in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I mean, great. I mean, it came out great. I love that album as well. It's, I mean, I always said while we're doing these albums, I always said when I get asked, what's your favorite album? I, I can't say, you know, because I'm in it. But now looking back, that's definitely one of my favorite albums. But I mean, Clayman is too. It's like having, you know, a bunch of kids. You, you love them equally, 
and you know, but they all have different characters. So you love them um, in different ways, but equally. Same with albums, you know, I love them all. I can't really say for now that I have a favorite and I can't say that I have a least favorite. There might be some songs I enjoyed playing more than others, but yeah. Yeah. And then the next album is A Sense of Purpose. And I believe this year is also the 15 year anniversary of this album. So well, how does that, what was that like work making this album? That was great because we were back in the in the same studio. I have studios. Uh, we had uh, Roberto Loggi as the uh, engineer and, and producer, and uh, recording with him is uh, one of the best you know uh, people I've ever recorded with. He's so such a huge, he has such a huge huge uh, musical interest. He's a great guitar player, and he has he's a great producer, and uh, it's very enjoyable to sit and chat with and to sit next to somebody recording your parts with somebody who not only has like a really positive uh, persona, but also has a lot of feedback to give and a lot of inspiration to give. And you can just like, hey, you know, I'm sitting here. I don't really know what to do on this part. What should you do? It's like, I want to try this. And it's like, oh, yeah, that, that sounds good. Well, maybe that inspired me to, to do this, you know. But it was a really fun album to make. Um, I think... Yeah, you know, I don't know. It sounds a little fussy maybe, but sometimes you you uh, remember certain emotions certain records and this is i have a very very warm emotion with this record this is a very light uh, bright record for me i enjoyed making it and i i still enjoy playing through those songs once in a while yeah like especially like mirrors truth and disconnected are some great songs while wow. so like i'm the highway is another great song Could yeah all classic shit i remember disconnected i, w I was sitting in a in a side room playing through that song because uh, we demoed it first. I think this is the first album we actually recorded twice. We recorded once for demos and then once to listen to. And I remember sitting in the side room, just coming up with all these bass fillers as, as you hear on Disconnected and uh, just looking out on Jesper. I was like, is this too much? You know, what do you think? I just get this vibe and he's like, no, go for it. Go for it. You know. So um, yeah, that was a fun album to make. Yeah, I especially love like the album artwork is just great. Even like the the insert with the right here is just great. Do you even do you even know who did like the album art because it just looks amazing? Not on, at the tip of my tongue right now, but I, it says there. It should say in there. Uh, uh, but this is, I think, most of the album covers were actually done in collaboration with uh, with our singer as he. Talk to the, the artist about his lyrics, about his visions and the way that he wanted them to come out, you know, and then he kind of presented the whole concept to us. And there was not a single time, I think, that we, we actually said no, you know, it was always great, you know, to see his words come to life, so to speak. Yeah. And then then you start touring for a little bit and then of course Jesper had left the band so and then of course you did the sounds of a playground fading what was that like being like the first album without Jesper it was weird um Jesper is uh, to this day one of my closest friends and has always been and throughout his struggles you know I, we've always been close um uh and making an album without him I mean, it was necessary at the time because he, he needed to do what he wanted to do. And uh, it was the first time where I actually, I remember noticing that Bjorn, who wrote the, all the riffs on this album, um, I remember thinking that, all right, now, now I know who wrote which riff in the past. Because Jesper writes a certain way and Bjorn writes a, cer a certain way. Uh, I'd like to say that Bjorn is more rock orientated and Jesper is more, um, how should I say, more, um, I don't know, <laughs> still rock, but uh, more classic rock is Bjorn and Jesper is more, I guess, more metal or death metal, so to speak, when it comes to the actual riff making. Then it all blends together perfectly. But I remember thinking that when I learned Bjorn's riff, it was more my way of thinking uh, logically. I didn't have to think so much as as to what should I play here. You know, it was very and not dissing Jesper at all, of course. Jesper is fantastic, but that's what I remember. Just this was more of a straight rock album, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so writing on it, uh, writing my parts on it, and 
and recording was very, very natural. Basically just playing along. And uh, I love that. I think that was great. In the past, it has had been fantastic as well. So I don't in any way not mean that anything was bad in the past, but I think that I remember that this was, like I said, it was just a fun moment just realizing, okay, that means Jesper wrote that riff and Bjorn wrote that riff. Which isn't entirely true because they wrote a lot of the songs just sitting the two of them together. But yeah, yeah, because I know it was a very were... fun album to make, but a, we- a weird one. Yeah, because I know like Jesper and Bjorn both have like different styles. Sorry? Because I know, no, it's like on previous albums, like you, I could tell because yeah. Jesper and Bjorn have both have different styles and everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, they they very much. Um, uh, completed each other, uh, which was very cool as well. Yeah, and had- but um, that was great. But at the at the same time, I remember feeling because we had Niklas in the band then, yeah. and he didn't play on the album. Uh, yeah, but was credited for reasons I don't really remember. He was credited, yeah, but I don't remember him playing on the album, and I don't rem- uh, I don't really remember why. I remember feeling it was a bit weird because it was in the band; it should be playing on the album, but. Bjorn wanted to do the guitars and, you know, it was, I guess it was important for him to do the guitars and it was in no way meant to diss Nicholas or something like that, but he just, he needed to do it. Yeah. And how'd you end up getting Nicholas in the band? Because I think he was filling in for Jesper for a little bit, but then eventually you're like, yeah, yeah, I want to join the band. Well, I joined in 97 and Nicholas also joined in 97 back in the day because then Bjorn was playing drums so we were actually on tour a couple of uh, times together we did the first Demo Warrior tour together Nikos was playing guitar and Bjorn was playing drums but when it came, was time to start doing Colony because Bjorn was originally uh, a guitar player um, he just uh, he said I want to play guitar now so we took in Daniel on drums instead Daniel Svensson and Niklas moved on to his other bands. And so when it was time to ask somebody to help out when Jesper needed some uh, some time off, it was just natural to ask Niklas. Like I said, Gothenburg is very small. Niklas and Bjorn comes from the same place and we all know each other and we get along great. So it was very natural just to ask him. And he, uh, he came in and I remember he learned, we were on tour with Slayer and he, he came in the day of the first show and he learned all these songs. And I think he played... Either he played the first show or he played the second show. I don't remember. But uh, he's a super fast learner and an amazing guitar player. And it was just, you know, we just all, we all clicked, you know. Amazing guy. Yeah. And then, of course, the next album is Siren Charms. And hardly next year will be the 10-year anniversary of that. They're kind of a different album. So what was the thought process going into making Siren Charms? Siren Charms. Uh, that was a little. Uh, it was a little different. That was that's when we made went to Berlin. Um, I guess uh, this was the first time that we decided to move the things abroad, and uh, we uh, we went there and we had the songs. And I think this is the first time also the songs were written. I think we were just basically sent demos at this point. Um, and of course, we got to put our input on them. But uh, I remember coming over to, to, uh, to oh, we went over to Germany. We took uh, Bjorn, me and Daniel, I think, took the, um, uh, the ferry over because um, we had so much great memories of taking the ferry over to Germany and, you know, enjoying ourselves. But we, uh, this, we, by some, accident somebody booked us on a cargo ferry so it was a boring trip <laughs> but we went over and uh we went into the studio the legendary hansa studio came in and just saw this this place where everybody all these fantastic artists had been playing it was like u2 and it was the uh, ringo star had been there and you know it was just you know a fantastic place we had roberto with us to do to be our uh, mixer and pro- uh, producer and then michael Hilbert did the mix and uh, his team did the mastering it was it was great, you know, being in one place where you're not connected to home, just focusing um, periods of time. Because I went back and forth from my home and, and there, and okay, now it's time to do some some drums. And I was there for about a week, listening to Daniel's drums and sitting, you know, hearing his amazing work. And that was time to do the guitars, and I was there for time to do bass. I 
forget which was her first. At the same time, Anders did vocals in another part of the house, uh, the complex, and uh, came down every night and listened to this, listened to that, you know, and uh, I, it was cool. It was a team effort. It was a little different being, like I said, a different country, a different environment, being in Berlin, such a historical city. And, um, but at the same time, I think we did a really great record. Yeah. And I thought, I thought it was interesting, like, right when, right, right when you were trying to, like, pr- promote the album, you released, like, a teaser by apparently faking fans to make it seem like a, a hacker took over their website. And, the, and then there was, like, an announcement saying that there would be a big announcement, but apparently... Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How'd the idea of that come to be? It was our uh, webmaster at the time. His name was Andreas Werling. Um uh, he came in because we were looking to do to redo our social media um, in a cool way. And I remember meeting with this big firm when we were on tour in Australia. They had a cool concept, and it's like, let's do this, let's do that. But the, they were ridiculously expensive, you know. And we, I, I don't really, I want to pay for quality. I don't want to pay for quantity, and I don't want to pay for just somebody saying that they're good. So we actually went back, and I was mutual friend who just told us about this guy. He's, he's uh, young, he's super talented and he's eager to, to do some cool stuff. And we met up with him and his team and they presented this cool idea that we started doing the, the, the band pages with. So uh, I forget if this is exactly when he came in. I think he came in a little earlier, but he had this idea. Let's just, just look at, this will be a, a fun thing to do for people. You know, something happens instead of doing the normal. He always, he always had some, cool ideas that actually made you flinch, you know, when you looked into stuff rather than just everything being the same everywhere. So uh, all the credit to that for him. Yeah. And then your last album with the band. Yeah, he ran our pages for... uh, I'm sorry, he actually ran our pages for a while uh, and came up with some really fun stuff that, uh, you know, I haven't seen anybody do before that. Um, Very innovative guy. He's super good at what he does. Yeah, and then I know you. The, the next step is the, your last album with In Flames, Battles. What what was that like making that album? That was a little different. Uh, it was in LA. Howard Benson was the producer. Uh, I recorded with a guy called uh, Mike Plotnikov. Um, I think I pronounced his last name right. Amazing guy. I actually came into this. I guess this is where I actually in my mind without knowing had realized that I, I I wanted to move on, you know, looking back into retrospect. So I just came into this. There were some finished songs and I had, I hadn't had any part in making them at this point. I just, I came into the, I flew into LA and they said, you're recording tomorrow. I was like, well, I haven't heard the songs yet, you know? So I went into the studio and we listened and the producer, Mikey, he had no idea about this. So it's like, are you ready? And I was like, uh, sorry, no, I haven't even heard them. So going back to Bjorn being a type of writer where I can follow him so easily because we think very much alike when it comes to, to music, I think. So I just started listening to the song and I played it through the first song. I forget which one I recorded first, but I started playing it, playing uh, along with it. I did that once or twice. And then Mike said, hey, that's perfect. Let's go. So there was it wasn't one takes, but it was like my... My first impression, my first meeting with the with the riffs is basically what you hear on the record, which is a fantastic way. I've never done it before, but it was a great way because a lot of times you you go back and then you rethink stuff and then you think, what I'm going to do on this part? Of course, there were some parts where I asked them to pause and I came up with some cool melodies, but most of the stuff on those songs are actually stuff that I sat down and played for the second or third time in the studio. Which made it like uh, you know this whole expression first impressions last you know instead of going back and changing stuff this what you hear is actually my first meeting with most of those riffs which was great but it was also something that made me feel a little bit not so much involved and I guess that also led on to why I shortly thereafter left the band. All right. Not that actually dissing somebody. I don't want to diss anybody. This is just the way that it was was done. Uh, I'm still very happy to be able to make that album, album and, you know, recording with Mike and being part of Howard's uh, production, so to speak. But it was um, it was a different way of doing it. And I don't think that I'd like to do an album like that again. 
had unless I am hired to be like a session decision or something like that. I want to be involved in the process as much as possible. And uh, on that album, I wasn't, but at the same time, it came out really good, and I'm I'm proud to say that I you know I just came in and I did my parts really really easy and uh, worked very well with with Mike, and um, it was definitely a cool experience. Yeah. And then I know, like, after you left in flames, you did a uh, Syrah with, of course, your fellow Halo bandmate, mate Jesper. How did the idea of that to start that band? That actually started while we were in uh, Germany rehearsing in flames. Jesper called me up and said, hey, I got this new project. Do you want, want to be part of it? And I said, uh, I don't know. You know, I don't really have time right now because I'm doing all this stuff with the inflames and um he said yeah well you know whenever you have time you know listen to, to we have some songs written and they kept writing and then i kept kept listening and i said this is great you know but i'd like to be part of the process i'd like to be part of the songwriting and i'd like to be part of you know the whole process and he said yeah no worries you know you're you're in you know if you want it so i said okay i'm in and um then we uh we started writing songs they had written most of the songs but they actually let you know did me the honor of just you know, like you put your part on it and if there's anything you want to change or do differently you know we'll 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 do it like that and they did so um we i came in and uh we recorded the album and we recorded the album after i quit in flames sorry i gotta go back here but yeah uh now i came in and um this is not why i left in flames this is just something that happened to come in the in the process of me leaving and uh, so to do the Syrah album again going back to Roberto Laghi as, as the guy who recorded me there um it was a healing process some sort you know because when I left in flames it was like divorcing four other guys at the same time you know it's it's a you you live together for 20 years and basically you know sharing same space sharing each other's meals and thoughts and ideas and emotions and to leave is not just to leave, and there was no bad blood. It was just I, time for me to move on, time to them for them to do something else, and um, but it was it was a hurtful time, you know. I was it shook me up, and it took a lot of time for me to actually understand that I needed to leave the band in order to feel good because I had this, I had about six months of anxiety. I had this huge pressure over my chest. I didn't know what it was, but the moment that I actually knew I need to leave this band, that's when the pressure left. So recording Syrah was uh, some sort of a healing process, just doing something else with some new musicians, uh, some new stuff, a different type of vocals and all that stuff. It was it was a fantastic experience. But at the same time, I told the guys, like, this is I'll do this album. I, I don't want to tour, and we'll see what happens. So when they actually started to want to tour i told him it's like you guys you guys go ahead and you do this because i'm i just want to be home with my family i've been on tour for 20 years and uh you know i'm just happy to be part of this great record you know letters to myself it's an amazing record and um i, I had I had a really good time doing it i'm just i'm trying to put my emotions in, into words while i'm uh, speaking here yeah and then i noticed like dirt after that you did like fleet burner Burner, I know 2020 did mm -hmm. the self-titled album. So, well, how did the idea? Where how'd you get to know everybody in the band band and start that project? It was actually Kevin uh, reached out to me through a mutual friend, um, and uh, basically just as it's, it's his project, it's his song, and he asked me and uh, if I wanted to play bass on it. So that's all that was to it. Basically, he sent me the songs, and I recorded the bass in my home studio and sent it back to him. And then we fiddled back and back and forth a bit with some stuff. And uh, so I was, I was a session musician for that recording. It's, it's all his project, his vision, his uh, genius uh, in writing all that stuff, but it was a great thing to do because it's a totally different style of music. I've never played that type of music professional before. And uh, I really enjoyed it. It's a great album. You should check it out. Great vocals and everybody, Everybody did really well, but I, I never actually met the other guys. We never rehearsed, and I'm not sure if there's going to be a second album. That's totally up to Kevin because he's the he's the songwriter and the genius in it. Yeah, yeah, and I know it's like around that time. I think you also, I think it was like you and Daniel. Daniel, you did like a odd odd island brewing. I mean, where the idea of that to make like your own kind of like little 
beer place and stuff. Oh, well, Daniel, uh, he quit one year before me uh, from In Flames, and he realized, you know, we basically grew up in this band. We basically uh, never really had any long-term jobs or anything like that. So when you make a career out of something like this, you need to you need to think about what you're going to do next if, if you start thinking about doing something else. And he, uh, I had started my restaurant, uh, 2112, and I had that uh, on the side, so to speak, and that started taking up a lot of time. And he wanted to do something else. And he was really interested in uh, beer brewing because started touring in, uh, especially America, we started learning about the craft beer industry very early. And it took us a few years before we actually started to enjoy it. And him especially took a huge interest in it and uh, started to read up on it, started to brew at home. And then he did like a, an internship at a local brewery where he lived. And then he's like, I'm going to do this. So when I leave the band, this is what I'm going to do. So he started there and started brewing some stuff. And then I actually told him, it's like, hey, if you want somebody to help you out here, I, I'm, I'm keen. You know, I, I like to do this. I like advertisement and I like doing PR and all that stuff. So it's like, yeah, that sounds great. But I, I want to learn some more stuff, too. So his first brew I actually took into 2112. And we did like a customer, uh, see how customers reacted to it. Sorry, I'm looking at a clock because I got to go to another meeting here. But um, yeah. and then uh, people loved it. And I told him, you know, this is great. People like this a lot. You know, they're gonna really appreciate this type of um, this type of beer, and especially in Sweden, there were some some breweries that had uh, been before. We got like uh, Hoppels and the Stig Barrett and, and like really big breweries that, that are really big now. They were early, and uh, Dugis is another one. But besides those, there was a few different ones, a few smaller ones. Uh, but we always imported beers from America to Sweden. And it takes three to six months to get it here. And we all love it. But having tried the fresh beers in America, we realized that it, it doesn't taste as well when it comes here as it does one year in America. So for him making, it was an APA, American Pale Ale that he did, called Citravan, was the first commercial beer. And to try something, you know, inspired by the American beer culture that was brewed here, made all the difference so he he, he loved doing that and uh, he um, invited me to come aboard and start uh, marketing it and doing that stuff and this was in he started 2015 and 2016 the summer i came aboard uh, just one second please let's take it all again it's coming so you can go for this one check it oh um i just gotta move you on to my car here because i'm gonna some stuff but yeah he um he did that and i came aboard and we started just doing it professionally so by the time i left in flames in 2016 we were up and running we were out on uh you know with our beer commercially on on all the stores and all that stuff and took it from there just same thing kind of like building a new band we did it all ourselves we had no nobody helping us out we you know danny was buying all the all the stuff that all the hops and the malts and all that stuff brewing himself. We were bottling ourselves, just the two of us. And then I was selling and, and we were both delivering. But that's how it started by doing it, going back to the roots after being, you know, after having, uh, you know, 20 something years of people doing everything for you besides playing. Awesome. Uh, I'm just going to put you like this for a little bit. That's all good. Oh, good. We could just talk, talk still. So, so tell me about like making the halo effect because this was definitely one of my favorite albums of last year, Days of the Lost. Like, I think thank you very much. 10 out of 10. Thank you. Thank you. So, if I can put you like this, there yeah. you go. Awesome. Uh, well, yeah, uh, halo effect was, um, uh, it's a funny story because the way that Niklas called me up. It's like, hey, do you want to do something? I was like, yeah, sure. What do you want to do? And let's have a meeting. You know, we took a meeting and it's like, I'd like to play some music together. And I was like, I don't know. You know, I, I, I still here, you know, enjoying my life at home. We started another restaurant at the time and I was, uh, we were doing well with our island and we were having a good time. And something Daniel and I told each other is like, from now on, whatever we do is going to be fun. You know, we're focusing on family and whatever we do on the side is, it's for fun. Of course, it's business, but it's going to be enjoyable. So when he came to us, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to break that cycle, but he had such a fantastic vision. 
we do this. We do everything together. Everybody gets to write music. Everybody's involved equally. We look. We we sat down and we said it's like Daniel was there as well. It's like we look at all the mistakes we've done in the past growing up. You know, as everybody does in the music industry. You know, not knowing all the loopholes and all that stuff, and not knowing the mistakes you can make. And we just try to do this uh, together, just to have a good time. And then we talked. You know, it's like should we? You know. Should we ask Jesper as well? Because he was around and you know, doing well. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. Let's ask him. And who should, who should sing? And I said, it's like, well, well, why don't we ask Michael? He's my old time friend from Dark Tranquility that I'm, you know, always hang out with, and, but never been able to play with. And I call him up and then Nicholas called up Jesper and we talked and we shared the vision with them. This is, you know, this is a, a band. We do it together. Everybody's equally involved. Um, and um, they both agreed. Then, if you fast forward a little bit, and we do, we talk about this. It turns out that Nicholas and Michael had already spoken to each other like six months before about doing something together, you know. And uh, Jesper and I always talk about doing stuff together. So it was it was kind of funny that everybody was still aboard without, you know, having any had having decided anything. So we actually we went into my home studio sat there nicholas showed some ideas that he had he had one or two finished songs um i think he had days of the lost pretty much finished that song and then he asked me for some ideas and i remember showing him uh, the beginning of gateways that i had and a different version where i'm like uh because i was writing some pop and funk song at the time i, I still do that um uh, and uh, i showed him a, a version uh more mellow version he said what if, what if we do it like this and we we made like a huge intro that came that's the intro to gateways and then he finalized the song and then we just kept on writing and he's such a he's such a musical genius nicola so he has he has all these ideas in his head all the time and he writes so much music so he kept on writing he kept on asking us for ideas and asking us some feedbacks on his ideas um that sat together with Jesper and they wrote some great stuff and we just sent songs back and forth and then we actually went into a, a friend of Nicholas's studio, uh, Oscar. He has a studio uh, in um, uh, in Gothenburg called Cree Hate and um, we went there and just kept on writing, recording and doing demos and then we figured well, how we would like to do this, how we want to do it, you know, in a great way we want to you know get it out the best way we could so we we contacted a, a, a management team and we contacted our old friends at nuclear blast and uh, they heard one song and they said hey we love it you know yeah so we like kept that. we kept on writing yeah actually like that is like we love it but then came the pandemic so we were ready to launch this you know by the end of uh, 2020 but you know, for very obviously reasons we couldn't. So we just kept on writing. We sat in the studio and we wrote and we recorded, I think, 17 songs for this album. And um, then we ended up choosing 10, yeah. making this album, putting it out. And uh, that's the way it came out, a short, short story. But basically just, you know, we're good friends. We enjoy each other's company. Uh, we've done this, some of us together, some of us not together, but we've done this for a long time. And... Um, we just had a good time. All this talk about, you know, us doing it, you know, I, I know there's been some talk about uh, In Flames and stuff like that, but that had nothing to do with it. It was just time for us to do something together. And Gothenburg is very small. Everybody knows each other. And the people that you know the best are the people you've been touring with or you've been growing up with. And that's why, you know, it ended up being five members who at one point played in this band, but had nothing to do with it. Uh, I know a lot of people like to spin it like that, but that's, that's no bad blood. There's no rivalry. It's just for the love of music and for the love of each other that we were able to do this. And I'm, I'm super happy about it. But now we are touring and now we're going out, enjoying, you know, some time on stage. And it's basically like going away on camp with your best buddies, getting to play some music and having a great time. And that's awesome. what we do. Awesome. And like I said, uh, this is definitely one of my favorite albums from last year here. And I especially like, cool, the thank you. 
I know you did, like, especially hearing, like, Shadow Minds for the first time, I was like, wow. How, and I remember somebody said, like, when former members of Inflames make a be band that's better than actual Inflames, uh, from what I heard it, but it definitely has that old, like, melodic death metal f feel, like, the mixture of, like, some Inflames with Dark Tranquility. I feel like everybody sort of, like, brings, like, their own kind of, like, style you know, to the Halo effect. Absolutely, and that was the point. We actually talked about that in the studio. I wonder what this is going to sound like because nobody had, there was no pressure. We got the pandemic, the time during the pandemic to actually see uh, what we could do. And um, sorry, I can't do two things at a time apparently. And uh, and then we uh, just ended up sounding like the way that it sounds because we, uh, like you said, we bring our own sound to the table. Basically, I play a certain way, Daniel plays a certain way. Michael sings a certain way, and Niklas and Jesper has their style, and together we're the halo effect, you know? Uh, not trying to sound like anybody else. Going back to this original idea with the previous bands, uh, you know, we just wrote music for ourselves, and then we chose the 10 best songs that we think, and we gave them to Nuclear Blast, and, you know, they released it, and now we're out there, and I, and I think it's fantastic. I love it. And I still think what, what Inflames does is great. So, I think music is so diverse and it's so big so you can can do whatever you want to do and you just try and enjoy it, enjoy it. and uh, like I said going back to us growing up in Gothenburg there's no rivalry there's just people playing music enjoying each other and enjoying the music and trying to help each other out and that's all there's to it yeah. that's the key yeah and especially like the I guess like you know it's like it was a Japanese bonus track but I also like the the path of fierce resistance. I think it's another great kind of like newish song. So how did the idea of that song come to be? Well, that was actually written together with the first, uh, the orig original batch. So uh, it was released as a Japanese bonus track, like you said, and then we, we revisited it a little bit just to get, get the new song out before this summer. Uh, but it was written with the same batch, but we, we kept, kept on writing and uh, we have, we went back to a few of those songs we wrote and we redid some stuff and then we wrote some more songs so now we have i think 12 new songs we have a new record done uh it's uh, mixed and it's mastered and, and uh, we're waiting for the record company to do their stuff so in 2024 you're gonna have a new halo effect album yeah i'm looking forward to that and and i know you also played like two new songs like become surrender and defiant one because i know you mentioned you had you wrote like 17 songs for days of the lost like were any of those songs like songs that were kind of like like scrapped for a new album or pretty much ready for the next one well it's a little bit difficult to say because nicholas has been writing throughout this whole process and he just presents songs all the time and it's like Wow, you're amazing, dude. You know, he's, he's, it never stops. His uh, riff making is is a genius, and and then he goes in together with with Jesper, and they sit, and uh, we all put down our 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 stuff on it. And you know, he's so gracious because he could he could easily write the music himself, but he wants to involve everybody, and that makes it more fun also because then you have your your say, you have your ideas, and you have you know, it's a, it's definitely a a mutual effort but it's all thanks to his you know uh, grandness so to speak yeah uh, yeah and yeah and i'm looking forward to the second album because th there's do you feel like like pressure to follow up days lost because this album is definitely a huge album like probably much one of the best modern debut albums thank you of all time thank you very much uh i don't feel pressure because i am back with my best friends and uh i know that the Genius is of Niklas and uh, Jesper and Daniel and Michael. Um, we do this together, and no, there's absolutely no pressure from my end. Um, and I'm very blessed coming in to you know hearing all these great ideas and being able to put my stuff down. And it's difficult to explain, but we don't do this to become the biggest band in the world. We do this because we love the music and we love each other and. We do this so that we can go out and play some shows and have some fun. Um, no, there, there's no pressure, not at all. 
Awesome. And I got a couple more questions for you, kind of like talking about like your bass playing, because uh, as I love how you don't gravitate towards like flashy bass playing, but instead I feel like you find ways to link what Nicholas and Jesper are doing with the melody and what Daniel is doing with the rhythm, but in a way that's very creative. So when it, how do you Thank approach you. like tracking the bass? Uh, it's a little different, you know, uh, depends on how much, how, how long I lived with the song, basically. Uh, but I'd like to remember that feeling when we did battles, you know, that I don't, I don't over practice in a song. I try and go into the studio and just jam through it a couple of times. Then when I feel comfortable, I play through it, you know, properly. And then I just start recording. And then Oscar, who's done these two albums with us, um, eventually when I feel, okay, I'm good to go. He's like, okay, let's go, you know. And uh, and then I just some stuff I learn. Some stuff, some some riffs are are super, you know, uh, groovy, and you just want to get into it. Some stuff, some riffs are a little difficult to to um, understand because I really want to understand the riff. I want to feel the music uh, in my whole body. And uh, then when it comes to all these little trips, musical trips, the, the little melodies that I do, they're mostly just, you know, one takes. I just, I just, you know, we go and it's like, he says, okay, do you know what to play? I was like, I have no idea. Just, just press record and then I play. And if I'm happy with it, we keep it. If I'm not happy, I redo it. But I never really sit down. Oh, I'm going to play like, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, nothing like, I just, I play what I feel and whatever happens, happens. Uh, um, and I do feel on some riffs that this one, needs something so i just try and to go in and improvise something cool and on some riff i feel that like i'm just going to groove on this one all right and so and the final question i wanted to ask you is pretty much like your your kind of like gear you play i'm always curious what kind of basses you play strings amps and pedals and all that stuff yeah uh well i gotta first you know say that when i left in flames this big band with you know uh, you know, going out in this long career in the past, I, I reached out to my uh, my uh, endorsers and I told them ahead this is going to happen. And um, my base endorser Ivanes, uh, he says, "No worries, man. We'll always support you, whatever you do." And I was like, "Whoa!" I was you know overwhelmed. And I went to my my uh, that was my um, base uh, amp endorser EBS. Same thing. It's like this is not the end. This is just the next chapter. I think they told me and I was like almost you know I was overwhelmed with all this support so I always use Ibanez and EBS as long as they'll have me because I love those I love those instruments I love those bases I use a lot of the prestige bases um, I have some old ones with the old type of wood that uh, isn't really allowed now but I also have some new ones uh, and um, in the studio I have I have some I have the prestige bases usually because I think the sound of them is very solid you got the, it's very uh, aggressive. You know, I don't even really use a lot of plugs or a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, you know, pedals or something like that to get the sound. It's, it's a lot of it is in my fingers and in the sound of the bass itself. Of course, I use some, uh, and I always uh, use the EBS. I've used the Fafners. I use the Fafners twos, but I, I really like the, the 802s that I have now. Uh, I think they sound really, really good. I have the Raidmar sometimes for uh, when I, you know, fly in shows, but as much as I can, I have the, uh, the 802s. And then I always have a, an MXR pedal live just for some sort of this distortion. I used the uh, Ashdown pedal. Uh, James Lomenso is a friend of mine. He's uh, currently in Megadeth, or back in Megadeth. He came up with a signature pedal a bunch of years ago that he gave me while we were touring together. And I, I always have that put very high so I can have like the almost. Um, machinery uh distortion kind of and i mix that with my mxrdi on very low this may this means i don't lose the the weight i don't lose the low end but i still have the the way of you know reaching through all the distorted guitars that so you can actually hear the bass so that's what i use uh, live uh and in the studio i try to use i go back to my fafna 2s a bunch of times try different type of ebs pedals and i mix it with some um some plugins, some plugin pedals that Oscar likes to use just to get the. I always call it like chopping in metal kind of sound, wet, distorted, thick, heavy. But at the same time, you can you can hear it 
not just feel it and um, try to play around with that. And then, of course, when we go into to the to the mixing, I know Jens likes to just you know take the whole uh, thing down and do his own version. But this time on the next on the on this album, so I actually try to keep as much as the original sound as possible, and then he can add his his uh, frequencies on it that makes it the way that it sounds. Awesome. And so before we go, Peter, just want to say thank you for this conversation. It was great to be able to chat with you. Is there just anything? Oh, thank you. Is there just anything else with the Halo effect that you'd like to plug in terms of like tours and stuff? I'm looking forward to seeing at Prog Power and 70,000 tons of metal. Is there just anything else you'd like to pro- Yeah, well, promote? I was going to say, the, the, yeah, the, the, those are the two shows that actually are booked. And uh, the, the thing with the Halo effect is that we won't tour a lot. Uh, so if you see us coming down, down uh, to your city, try and, try, try and catch us, us because I don't know when we're going to go back. We're going to try and tour as much as possible within our limits, but at the same time, we don't want to be a band that tours 10 months a year. We want to make every show count. So if we come to, you know, not like now, uh, Prog Power in Atlanta, you know, be sure to be there because I don't know when we'll we'll be back. You know, it probably won't be until we release the next album. So, try and enjoy uh, anytime we come by, and try and enjoy our music. And uh, you know, I uh, hope you enjoy what we we'll put out in the future. And uh, if you haven't heard us, pick us up on wherever you find your music. We'll we'll be there. And thank you for everybody's support. Awesome. So everybody, Peter Iwers from the Halo Effect. We'll see you next time. <laughs>